And now we are going to go in with our next guest. We are really excited to welcome Joshua Pierce. So Joshua Pierce is a professor over at Western University in London, Ontario. So again, basically my neighbor as I'm based in Kitchener, Ontario. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's great to have you here today, Joshua. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So one of the reasons why we wanted to have Joshua on our stream is that he is one of our lifetime members. That is a membership option. You can be a mm -hmm. lifetime member, pay one time, membership forever. <laughs> yeah, not, not going away from open hardware anytime soon. Amazing. <laughs> So uh, Joshua, how about you tell us a little bit about your journey with open hardware? How did you come to it? So I, uh, can I share my screen? I can yes, kind of yes, of course, sure. get your sh screens shut up, but set up and then- Set up and shared. Set up and shared. <laughs> this might take a little second. Yeah, no worries, take your time. We're really good at filling time with random chatter. Yeah. It's a <laughs> skill um, my mom loves. <laughs> She's always been excited about that. <laughs> All right. So it's processing. It's almost there. Hopefully, Perfect. Oh, yeah. a lot of mm -hmm. hopefully a lot of interesting pictures. So I, I can kind of tell the story of how I got into open hardware. Yeah. The I, I've always been a fan of open source, and so like I'm old enough now that you know when I started in in university there was no like you didn't really have internet beforehand. So in high school, I knew one kid with the internet and we used to pay him a quarter to print us out a sheet like per page that he could get from the internet. And it was so exciting because you get information from Japan and that was basically impossible um, before that point. And so um, I'd been a big fan and kind of like set up Linux servers for my friends. Okay, here we go. So can you, yes. Um, okay, so so I was already into to the kind of the software side of things. And I was working on a project uh, that was kind of an MIT spinoff where they had a laptop that they were giving children in the developing world. And the idea was you'd have this laptop that everybody could get educational resources on. It was going to be awesome. And then they found out that the kids didn't have electricity. And so our, our project, we, I'm a solar cell scientist by training. Uh, the idea for us was to try to find a way to solar power this laptop. We developed this system and we wanted to prototype it. And I was finally at a university with a rapid prototype or a 3D printer and we made it and it was awesome, but it cost $65 for the plastic. And of course that was almost as much as the computer. It was way more than the electronics. And so I started looking around for a solution. And that was right when Adrian Boyer had open sourced the RepRap project, the self-replicating prototyper. And from that point on, I, I think my life was changed because it affected the research that I went into and kind of everything became open. So I, I have an endowed chair at Western University and it's it, as part of that chair, I run the Free Appropriate Sustainability Technology Research Group. So the FAST Lab, the, and the important thing for the kind of open hardware community is that first word free. Everything we do um, is free. So what I mean by that is that on Apropedia.org, which is the largest sustainability wiki that everybody can edit, um, off of FAST, we provide everything that we produce. So open access to all of our articles, all of our literature reviews, our methods pages, which include our hardware designs, software service code, firmware. We even have uh, kids books if you've got children or, and you want to kind of like take them baby steps into to open hardware. Um, we've got some resources for you. We have um, thousands of people that follow us in the academic community and hundreds of thousands of page views on, on Apropedia every year because I, what I hope that we're doing is providing actual useful things for people. In addition, well, we publish our books open. And you might imagine how a dean might feel about an academic literally giving everything away for free, like we're actually actively anti-patenting things so that everybody can use them. Um, but the, the reason that we do it is that it's effective. And so the, the last book that Lonnie uh, Grafman and I wrote, so he's the founder of Apropedia as a professor in California, uh, is called To Catch the Sun. And what it basically does is it starts off with some stories of just normal everyday people that had an energy related problem and then how they solved it with solar. And then we go into the nitty gritty of how you can build a solar system to solve your problems, whether it's you know keeping vaccines cold um, in the middle of nowhere or powering, say, your house or your business. And everything is there to get you up to code in the, the US and Canada and kind of hopefully fill you with the 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 
belief that you can do it too. That's really what the, the book is all about. And it's 100% free. You can download it uh, easily off of Apropedia or academia.edu or the, the book's website. And you might say, well, why, why would I do this? Well, part of it is that this chair, um, this is the chair is named after John Thompson who really helped bring open source software to Canada um, in kind of taking Linux from a nothing product for IBM to a multi-billion dollar product in just a couple of years. So uh, he gets it. He understands how you can get more innovation faster if you kind of embrace the open source community. And probably most of you listening are very, very aware of this. Uh, what I'm hoping to do today is for those of you considering academia as a career path, I want to show that not only can you do open source and be successful, but you can be extremely successful. And even if you're not an academic or have no interest in being like you're going to start a company or you already have a company, um, you can partner with academics in a way that kind of keeps everything pure and open. And so when you apply open source in the kind of the research university, a typical research university professor like me would publish two papers a year. If you're at a top kind of like tier one, R1 type research school, uh, you might get five or seven. And our group publishes 40 to 50. And it's not because I'm sort of, I'm sort of a genius. It's because I apply the open source process to the research work itself. And so we end up with being able to create more in intellectual property, more knowledge from our group comes out every year than what you'd expect over the entire career of kind of a normal professor. Um, it also creates an enormous amount of business opportunities because it's very, very easy uh, to work with us. And so um, how do we do it? Well, first of all, we have faster collaboration. So we get free global engineering help. Um, everybody that's in open hardware already knows how this works. You share something good, other people pick it up and start sharing um, their improvements back to you. And suddenly you've got people that you'll never meet um, all over the world helping you. It's extremely easy to collaborate. So normal um, academic industry partnership involves NDAs and you gotta get lawyers involved. It, take, it could easily take six months before you can do anything. If you wanna work with me, I could shake your hand if we're in like physical proximity or we just make an agreement over email and we just begin working together immediately. We don't need any of that. We never get the lawyers involved. It goes much faster. I can usually finish a project before uh, even start uh, his or hers. Uh, from an academics perspective, kind of like our remuneration isn't so much money, it's citations, it's showing that we have an impact. And so when you do an open source project, you get more exposure, you don't have embargoes, there's no secrets. Uh, I'll show you some examples in a minute about how we use the open hardware process to develop our own scientific hardware. This reduces our own costs, which makes it so I can take grant money and stretch it further, and maybe hire more students and get more things done. And then finally, and this is maybe the most important thing, is I get better students and employees. Why? Because everybody has their name all over everything. So when they're developing and pushing it up on GitHub or GitLab or the Open Science Framework or Apropedia, it's their work. We're working together and collaborating as a team and pushing everything through Western. But overall, um, they have their name on it. So we get better work from them and we get people that want to show off that they're actually good. They're not embarrassed about it. They want their name all over everything. So as an example of kind of this fast process uh, in London, uh, we uh, teamed up with FSSC, which is Food Security Structures Canada. They develop agritunnels. And this is a, a picture of some of us in an agritunnel. It's a vertical growing system. And we've coupled together, we got a, a million dollar grant to take this to commercialization. I'm very happy to say this is ready now. If any of you are interested in doing some industrial scale indoor growing, uh, we've got lots of toys uh, for you. So you can buy the system from them directly. And then you can use a lot of the things that we've developed like the agrivoltaic part that makes it economic as well as uh, free and open source uh, computer vision software that helps you identify if your plants, for example, have diseases. Um, so I, I kind of already mentioned how I got in, in, involved in open hardware. So you can see that one laptop per child in the kind of lower left, that little green laptop. And we, so that was kind of my introduction to 3D printing. And the, the first 3D printer that I, I bought it as a kit, you can see that in the back left, it was terrible. It broke the first day that we used it. I had two students spend an entire summer putting it together with me. And the first time we used it, that one of the students had to hold the corner together because it broke and we were printing out another corner to fix it. But that kind of gives you a hint as to how powerful open hardware could be that if you have the designs and you can fabricate the replacement parts and the fixings for the tools that you have, it's a giant advantage. And so fast forward in the, the next semester, we started off and RepRap had already started to evolve uh, on the internet and we started building our second one. And you can see the Brennan there, it took him a semester for one person to build uh, the printer. And you can see that 
we're still using a lot of scavenged parts like the power supplies from other computers. Um, but you can see it's less parts. It's more, it's better. It's a better printer. And it's because you had people from all over the world working together to, to make it better, including our group. Now, by version three, things really started to kick. And the, 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 this was at the beginning of the summer. And for academics, at the beginning of the summer is when you get your most work done over the summer. Well, I was doing solar cell research. And one of the, the studies that we do, we put, put different colors of filters in front of the path of light and see how. And you usually do this with an automated filter wheel changer. So I had one in the lab and it just broke. And it, it was going to cost $2,500 to replace, which is irritating. And the reason it was so expensive, because all it's doing is rotating around and putting a different filter in, in place on the path of light, is that hardly anybody uses them. So it's just me and a couple other, other solar cell scientists kind of scattered throughout the world. And so there wasn't just a massive demand. This isn't something you're going to find in Walmart. And so that was bad. But what was worse is it was going to be five month lead time until I could get it. And so instead of that, I hired a high school student. I gave him a discarded computer that from the, the, uh, the university. We stripped off Windows and put on Linux so that it could actually still work. They had kind of retired it because it was so slow. We put on OpenSCAD, which is a script-based CAD package. And then he developed the best filter wheel changer in the world. And the reason it was the best is that it's completely customizable. So if I wanted more filters or less filters, different sizes, if I wanted to control the speed, go back and forth, I had complete control. So it was controlled with an Arduino. Um, it was 3D printed on this. Uh, you can see the third version of RepRap in our group. You can see it's getting better, still using scrap parts, still extremely uh, low cost. And we were able to make something that was better than anything anyone else could buy at the time. And I published an article on science kind of letting other scientists know that, hey, this open source thing, this RepRap stuff, it actually is ready for showtime. You can make equipment that everybody would want um, in the, the comfort of your own home. The other interesting thing, and this goes, goes back to, to Brennan's work, is we did a, another piece where we um, got help from a massive um, number of open hardware advocates throughout the world. Uh, at the time, people were saying, you know, you can't really make 3D printed parts that are any good. They're junky. They fall apart. And that wasn't our experience. And so we set out to prove it. So we set up they had the protocols to do the mechanical testing and published on the web that anybody who wanted their stuff tested, they would follow this protocol, um, follow our rules, write down what your printing settings were and send us your samples and we'll test them for you for free. So we did that. And what was interesting about that is that using um, ABS, which is what the kind of corporations that have had a 20 year head start, had patented 3D printers um, that had just expired in patent, which made the RepRap project possible, using ABS, more than half of random people on the internet could make stronger parts than the top company in the world that was an American company at the time. And more importantly than that, because you'd had people from all over the world doing experiments, they were finding other materials. And so one of the ones that is, is now the most popular 3D printing fused filament materials, polylactic acid. And so it has basically double the strength of what you'd expect from the kind of the industrial ABS. And so the open source community just not just beat, but crushed what you could do in the proprietary space, even with a well-financed company that had good solid engineers, you can't compete with everybody. And so we started developing printers. I taught a class, the class is free online. So you can pick it up at Wikiversity um, on how to build a 3D printer from scratch and then use it to do uh, more and more detailed design projects to actually make products. And uh, you can see that the printers that we're making were, look totally different because somebody in Germany had said, hey, you can make a pretty good, decent printer using a pick and place robot. Why don't we make an open source pick and place robot and make it a printer? We agreed and we've been uh, pushing on them hard ever since. Now, the ones that we could do with students that, that look like that, it's an eight hour build and cost less than $500. And so now you've radically reduced the price of 3D printing. You know, that first 3D printer that I ever got to use was half a million dollars. And now it's 500 and everything about it is better than the proprietary version. At this point, I wrote a book called The Open Source Lab, which is how you could start to create your entire scientific lab using these open source principles and fabricating your own hardware. And then, um, you know, with the class, we, of course, had to evolve. And so part of the class, if you took it as an undergraduate student, you had to kind of do these design projects. But if you took it as a grad student, you had to make a material change, a substantive difference in the printer itself. And so, of course, kind of kind of coming from our, our solar group, uh, Jet, Jephias, developed the first solar powered uh, Delta RepRap. And so the idea here is if you could take a duffel bag anywhere in the world, you now have a manufacturing system. And so he went on to become the director of research and innovation 
at the Great Zimbabwe University and actually became a full professor before I did. So he has an immensely successful career also built upon this foundation of open hardware. So how does this open hardware work for, for scientists? Uh, so let's say you're a scientist and you design a test tube because you need it for your experiment. If you take that one little extra step of sharing it with the rest of the global community, they can build off of it. And so then the second and the third scientist there, one builds a test tube stand and the other one a centrifuge where they're using that test tube. And so the first scientists save both of them time. They're obligated to reshare with the sharing the kind of the viral open source licenses. And then that first scientist now has two much higher value added products that took way more engineering time than her initial thing that she can fabricate off of her own 3D printer and go to work. And so I, I ran a kind of a review of all of the open source uh, scientific tools that have been developed up to 2020. And overall, you will save as a scientist 87% if you manufacture the, the things yourself from open source plans. If that thing, whatever it is, has an Arduino and is made up of 3D printing, that the savings go up to 94%. So there's a very strong economic argument to be made for scientists that are adept at building their own equipment to immediately kind of leap on the, the shoulders of the giants and, and build your own. To give you a feel for how extreme this can be, um, you know, I'm a solar cell guy, putting stuff in the path of light. One of the ways that you do that is with a lab jack. And so for the setup that I had, I needed a lab jack to just move a uh, filter just for a small period of time and back off. And I didn't want to use the fill the colored one. This was for this was the way the setup was was needed. I needed something that could just move up and down. And so the the company that gave me the kind of the proprietary tool for the whole thing offered me a nine hundred and fifty dollar lab jack. Now that this this is the same as a jack you'd have in your car. It's only less strong. Like there's no reason in the world it needed to be that big. So I used the same approach again hired a high school student, gave them a project and a 3D printer and said, make it. And so that lab jack in the back we made for about $5. You can see it has a lot of what we call vitamins, which are mechanical fasteners that we had left over from building rip wraps. And it was good. Uh, we posted it on the web. The next day, somebody in Poland said, that's pretty nice. But if you turn around the top of it, you'll get larger extension. And so you won't need as many uh, printed parts. Um, you can save on plastic to get a certain height. And you know what? He was right. <laughs> He made our design better in one day um, just by making a very simple change. So that kind of percolated on the, the internet for a little while. And then somebody else later in France made an even better version than ours, kind of in the lower right, that used only a couple fasteners. And then someone else later in Seattle made one that is 100% 3D printed. And so now when we make lab jacks in our lab, we make them for a dollar. And so we're saving nearly a thousand dollars of what was commercially available to what you can fabricate yourself as long as you have access to an open source method of manufacturing. Um, we do this kind of thing all the time. So uh, we made syringe pumps for ourselves to do 3D printing experiments with them. Uh, they were kind of later evolved into fluid handling robots. So you can do you know, this is a 95 well plate uh, thing for biology. It can be used to to manufacture different types of material and kind of combining SLA and fused filament uh, together. And it can be used as a research tool itself, like you can get force feedback. Um, looking at the number of times that our designs for this open source syringe pump library were downloaded um, in just the first year, the return on investment for the scientific community was 150% on the low end, buying the cheapest possible syringe pump you could find it, and, you know, off of uh, eBay, up to 12,000% if you had something like a dual syringe pump like that's shown up here that we actually developed in the, the course of making that project. So the impact one can have on the scientific community by sharing your scientific designs is massive. That particular design has been downloaded over 25,000 times, presumably to manufacture to help other labs radically reduce their cost for fluid handling their syringe pumps. Um, we've also had students go on then to create companies. And so uh, an example for this is Ben, who started Kajenzi, which is a 3D printing company that uses solar power um, deltas to make medical equipment um, for humanitarian responses, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. And the things that he would make would be something like that clubfoot brace. And so again, the clubfoot brace shown there is an open source design. It's completely customizable. It is better than everything available on the market and it costs less. And all you need access to is a 3D printer, um, which of course could be run off of solar and put anywhere in the world. Now, a lot of what I 
do or develop for open hardware is things that don't exist yet. It's something that I want. So anyone that's had a 3D printer for any length of time has a bunch of plastic waste because you try things. It doesn't cost that much. It doesn't work. You can iterate and go, go really fast. So you end up with a lot of waste. So we made the first RecycleBot, um, which the, the very first one was, was uh, well, the very first one exploded. And then the second one that I built that we published <laughs> was way, way over-engineered. So it wouldn't do that. And so the idea is you take from a milk jug, um, you shred it up, run it through this uh, single screw extruder, make filament, and then 3D print the filament into things that you want. And so the, the last recycle bot that we've published is a reparable recycle bot where most of the components are 3D printable themselves. And so if you have access to a 3D printer, um, so basic electronics and a little couple things you pick up from the hardware store, you can make a tool that can make your filament. Um, and for radically less, we're talking for less than 10 cents per kilogram. You buy filament now for 20 to $30 per kilogram, depending on where you are. Um, in, in going even further than that, you can start to print that waste dir directly. And that's what we did with Re3D and the Gigabot X. Um, let's just take, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We, we just have a, a very stacked schedule yep. with um, about 50 more people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. in the lineup, but this is really amazing. I, I really love what you're saying because I also work in academia and it's so hard to convince them of the value of open source. And I just feel like the work that, that you folks are doing is super, super important. And I, I really, really love to see it. Um, where can people go to learn more if they, um, you know, maybe is there a yeah. place they can download the rest of your slides or how can they get in contact? With yes. You? So, the, so the way to get in contact with me is joshua.pierce at uwo.ca. And the more importantly is apropedia.org slash fast. And so we have a large group. It does dozens of open hardware projects per year. Uh, this last year, we've pumped out a whole big bunch from things on for the solar industry, for developing your own microgrid, um, even to uh, grow plants indoors for yourself. So if anybody is interested in the areas of food, in uh, energy, or developing open hardware for science and 3D printing, we probably have some things that will be uh, useful for you. And you can find all about them at apropedia.org slash fast. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. We're okay. really excited to see everything that comes out of your work is it's been fascinating to see just how much y'all have done so far yeah. and much of it gets uh ashwa certified although not all of it i think <laughs> it's it's easiest to do ashwa certification if you're considering commercializing it and we definitely mm -hmm. encourage our students to do that whenever possible so anybody that's interested in collaborating we're very very open to collaboration anything that kind of where our interests overlap let me know and any of the young viewers interested in graduate school or postdoc i'm always looking for bright people that are open hardware advocates incredible amazing yeah keep that in mind folks okay. thanks right. for me a more yeah. fun <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much, much. josh we'll see you soon bye-bye <laughs>